I think I was in this mindset or in this place of I'm not a good enough mom, I'm not a good enough pastor's wife, I'm not a good enough designer, I'm not good enough, I'm not good enough, not good enough. And so we're trying to be good enough, which is, again, a false belief because we aren't good enough. Yeah. No man is right. righteous, no, not one. That's right. <laughs> that should free yeah. us that we're not good enough. Yes. It should make us want to strive to be good enough. Yeah. And when I got liberated from why am I trying to be good enough? I'm not. Mm-hmm. Without Christ, I am nothing. Mm-hmm. That's the wrong focus. That's the wrong motivation. I am mm-hmm. to empty myself, have that relationship with him, let him pour out of me. Then I don't need to be enough because he is. Join the conversation and welcome to Inside Voice. Hello, friends, and welcome. Have you ever wondered if your life is too far gone to ever find redemption? Is it possible that God finds tremendous value in us, even when we cannot love ourselves? Well, my guest today would say yes, he does. And he is the reason this husband and wife duo individually discovered that Jesus reaches into the darkest pit of existence, not only to rescue them from a world of hopelessness and shame, but to restore and make all things new again. Sean and Micah Abinanto are pastors of the Oaks Church in Oklahoma City, a place where everyone is welcome. And they are both entrepreneurs. They have three kids. Micah is the owner of Micah & Company, a very successful design firm with clients nationwide. Since 1988, through speaking and coaching, Sean has been helping thousands of people become solid, strategic, and solution-oriented leaders in life, and in business. And I can't wait for you to hear their story. So Sean and Micah, without further ado, I want to welcome you here today and thank you for being with me. Thank you for having us. Yeah, we're, we're, excited. we're excited to be here with you, Brenda. Yes, well, you are gorgeous people and you're beautiful inside and out. And I know that uh, we have so much in common, kind of had this friendship through my husband and I'm so excited to tell your story today. But, um, you know, for the sake of our viewers, I want you both to just start talking about a little bit of your backstory. What did life really look like for each of you? Um, before Jesus came into the picture. Can you tell us, uh, Sean, you want to start? You want to tell us a little bit about what your life looked like before Christ? Okay, so no ladies go first, I guess, today. So, So, you know, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I grew up um, the first five years of my life. My grandfather was a minister for 37 years, come from a long line of people in ministry. But my folks divorced at five and that shifted everything for us. We didn't mm-hmm. go to church anymore. My mom became a single mom, putting herself through school, working you know, two jobs, the whole thing that single moms embrace. And uh, so due to that, we were put in situations where we had caretakers and so forth. Um, I was molested at age six and nine. Oh, so wow. once again, the shifting of how life should be, how life was created to be, yeah. just yeah. changed for me. And so mm-hmm. that put me into a place where you're kind of just going through life trying to figure it out. And that led to my teen years and and into my 20s, where I went back to church for a brief time at age 20. But unfortunately, the church I went back to, uh, just honestly, there just wasn't a lot of acceptance there. The love of Christ was not evident in that church. And so I only lasted about six months because I was like, man, if this is what God is like, then I don't want any part of him. This is not like the love I used to experience at my grandfather's church when I was a small child. So wow. I was back out into the world all through my 20s, um, ran hard trying to fill the hole in my heart and found myself living in Los Angeles from Oklahoma at the time um, in Van Nuys, California, and uh, knew I needed to get back into church, was sitting in a bar one night having a beer, talking to God, saying, I have everything that, that the world tells you to have, but I'm still miserable and I have no hope. Mm-hmm. And so I reached out, discovered the little church called the Church on the Way with an amazing man called Jack Hayford as the single pastor. Yeah, Pastor Jack was my first pastor as I rededicated my life. Come on, that was a sweet place to land. (laughs) That's true. Yeah, so I came from a Church of Christ background into Foursquare, spirit-filled, come on somebody, ready to get after it. Yeah. My with my hair on fire, never looked back. And uh, God said, there's more to me than what you've known. Yeah. And I want to take you on a journey. And so that started in 1996. And uh, here we are. 
Wow. So in that, in that journey, did you experience a disconnect really from God where, um, I mean, what happened in, in terms of your values and, and your lifestyle? Well, my values and lifestyle went right out the door because, you know, when you are in pain, you look to medicate it. And, and so for me, uh, that's exactly what I did. You know, I was very pr promiscuous. I think when you get molested as a small child, yeah. the definition and the understanding of what true intimacy is just goes right yeah. out the window. And yeah. so for me, the message I received as a small boy mm. was that I was disposable. Right. And so that I became just a thing, just a toy mm. for people to play with and throw away. So, uh, mm. but at the same time, it's all I felt I had to give. It's, it's the only value add that I had as, as a human being. So that was my struggle all through my teens and twenties. Mm -hmm. And so for God to take that and start to shift that into, you are a value, you are a yes. you're, you're, you're so worthy. I sent my son to die for you. You're created in my image. My DNA is inside mm -hmm. of you. So to start to shift the mindset, the framing, the perception yeah. of how I saw myself was, you know, the biggest thing that I embraced is kind of growing into the greatness, you know, that he puts inside yeah. all of us. Amazing. Yeah. I too struggled with the same kind of issues, having had sexual trauma at the age of eight. So mm -hmm. it was something that really um, kind of split my identity. And I, I dealt with tremendous shame and self-hatred. And even though I was uh, quite the performer and loved God and all these things, you know, I, and I was a perfectionist, I didn't like myself and it took me a long time. And it was in my adult years, really, that it, it that epiphany uh, came to me through my own unraveling, which, Micah, I think that I'm, I'm going to hear some things from you, too. I want to hear your backstory. I mean, tell me about your childhood and some of the things you experienced uh, and how you met Jesus, really. Uh, so, you know, I was uh, not growing up in church at all, um, never really went and was quite a proud atheist uh, oh. later in my late teens. Um, but when you think you come from an animal, you behave like one. Yeah. And wow. That, that really uh, was a, a quite destructive mindset because before uh -huh. the age of 20, I had had three abortions. Yeah. Uh, and from the age of 14 to 21, I was in and out of drug treatment centers, mm -hmm. um, quite the partying, a lot of promiscuity as well. And uh, just a lot of despair, a lot of mm -hmm. self-hatred, and really had no hope. Um, God was not mentioned in my world, um, but I knew that I was getting to a place after one uh, failed attempt suicide. I was getting to a place where I wanted to try to kill myself again. And so I went to re a recovery program and for the first time thought, okay, either there is a God or there's no point in living. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It is, it, in my life, it had become one or the other. And so... Mm -hmm. Life was so bad without God, and so what if I'm a fool for believing there is one? <laughs> Let's just give this a shot and see what happens. Yeah. And it was wow. really life transforming for me. Yeah. Um, uh, from that encounter, I had met a man, um, my ex-husband, who was a Baptist preacher's kid. God bless him. <laughs> but, um, you know, we met, we got married, and we entered into ministry. Um, and God has used the testimony of overcoming uh, drug addiction and even overcoming the inability to forgive myself for my three abortions. Yeah. Uh, it was a really awakening moment for me to realize that I was, uh, quite frankly, being very prideful, resisting the thought that I could forgive myself because we're so supposed to forgive like Christ forgave, right? Mm -hmm. He forgave us freely. So for me not to forgive myself freely uh, is trying to do it my way, not the way that sure. scripture right. says. Yeah. Um, and I feel completely liberated from those choices. Mm -hmm. The way I say it is I don't even feel guilty for not feeling guilty that I have right. had abortions. Yeah. That's true. You freedom. know, it's it's that's such an amazing uh, and, and good point that you're bringing out because I think we struggle um, a lot with for, not just forgiving others but forgiving ourselves and uh, you know one of the things that my own father on his deathbed it took him all the way to his deathbed 
to ask my forgiveness for something that he was so ashamed of that he could not forgive himself. But here he was about to meet his maker. And, you know, God used that to bring in such grace and such um, healing. It was, it's amazing how, you know, the Lord is there and he's, he's, he's calling to us and he wants in, but we're the ones that are so guarded and we, we self protect and we, we will disconnect from God and even from ourselves in those places that we feel such pain. So what did that look like for you to experience, begin to experience the, the person of Jesus on your, on the daily? I mean, was there struggle involved? Was there, you know, how did those old mindsets begin to change where you knew that you knew? Uh, for me, there still is a struggle. I'll be very honest. And I think it does go back to uh, childhood daddy issues Yeah, um, mm -hmm. where the person of Jesus I struggle with, but not the word of Jesus. Right. Uh, the That's word true. of Jesus, you know, you know, I was going to yeah. say the verse for if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemns us not, then we have confidence in God, right? That verse about self-condemnation we're not supposed to have. The word is alive and I freely believe in it, but at times yeah. I struggle with the relationship with him as a you know, person to go to. And mm -hmm. uh, Sean has helped me with that a great deal because he talks yeah. to God like daddy, like he's his yeah. father. And I'm like, going to hang on your coattails a little bit with yeah. that. <laughs> okay. So I was about to ask you, Sean, um, you know, with a background like yours uh, and, and the things that the enemy tried to sift your life with, um, you know, how did you discover that your father was good and he loved you and he's not the, the abuser. He's not the, the person who's coming to steal or kill or even to condemn you. Um, what does that picture look like for us? I think, you know, I go back to my papa because, you know, here was a man that loved God and loved people so strongly with his entire being, this little 5'8 Italian guy that just would give all of himself to, to people. And so I knew that the love of God existed. Mm -hmm. And I knew at some point I would want to go back to it. But for me... You know, it's interesting that you use the term sifting uh, because, you know, when Jesus was talking to Peter and he said, you know, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as we, right? Woo, not a good process, not a fun process. What I love about that scripture is that he doesn't say, but, you know, I told him no, because we know that Satan has to ask for permission, right, to even have access to our life. He doesn't say, I told him no. He says, I prayed for you. And then he says, but, ooh, there's always a but in life because we're human beings and we make mistakes. Yeah. He says, but when you return to me, yeah. strengthen your brethren. Mm -hmm. He knows our heart to come back. Yeah. Into relationship. Yes. So for me, it was coming back into the relationship. I couldn't wait. Mm -hmm. And so what I quickly realized is that I have scars. Yeah. But scars are a sign of healing. They're mm -hmm. a sign of life. They mean we made it. And yeah. so for me, I got excited about that because without the scar, we have an open wound. And as we all know, open wounds lead to infection, which lead to death. Yeah. And that That's could great. be physical, spiritual, emotional, relational, intellectual. There's so many different deaths we can experience in life. Mm. So for me, I got excited to say, hey, I have scars. Jesus showed his scars. I want to show mm -hmm. my scars so people know that you can have hope. And so that's why yes. I became big about sharing my story and showing my scars. The Bible says we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Right. So when we launched the Oaks, which I know we'll talk about later, it was all about that safe okay. place where people could share their stories, show their scars, and let the yes. love of Jesus have his yeah. way. Oh, that's so good. I think there's this, there, a lot of, of the disconnect that we have with the Father God really is because we've experienced this disconnect in, and a brokenness in our relationships. And I mean, this has been since the beginning of time and just the assault on our identities and the assault on 
the, the church, which really is the family, you know, if you think about it, um, speaking of uh, Peter, you know, I, I think there's such a, a beautiful example that we can all look to. I, I don't think that we come to that sweetness. I mean, you got emotional a minute ago talking about coming back to him. And when you come back to him, you've experienced, you've tasted and you've seen that he is good. But what, what takes you there is that place where it's unmerited. And we know that, listen, I don't deserve this. And I know who I am without God. I know the mess that I am without God. And that I come to the end of myself. And it's in that place, just like Peter, when he denied the Christ. And yet this was the one that Jesus prophesied upon this rock, I will build my church. And so I think every one of us has to come to that place of uh, our aha moment with, you know, where we bump into our humanity and we realize, I mean, we've, we've kind of, for so many generations, we've, we've been trying to do it backwards, I think, and, you know, striving to be like Christ and doing things in our own efforts. But it's a cognitive experience instead of one that comes from the heart. Would you agree with that? Can I, can yeah. I just share one yeah. thing is that I think I had to change my expectation of what it meant to be a Christian because I naively thought that when I became a Christian, life would be easier. Yeah. Wow. And that yeah. I thought because <laughs> I had a relationship with Christ, bad things wouldn't happen. Yeah. And because I prayed, Good. he would answer. And when you enter into that relationship with Christ and bad things do happen, like an F5 tornado and you lose everything, the prayers don't get answered being in a marriage for 15 years and him still choosing to use. Yes. When you're faced with such adversity as a believer, I think we're naive to think that then Christianity doesn't work and the relationship becomes severed because there's not really a voice out there saying just because you come become a Christian, just because you pray, just because it looks like you're doing everything right doesn't mean like it's going to feel mm-hmm. like it's right. It, right. It's quite exactly the opposite. <laughs> yeah. You know, trials come will come. Tribulations uh-huh. will come. And I think that there needs to be that voice out there to say um, it's going to be tough, Mm -hmm. right? (laughs) Absolutely. Say that. (laughs) I I agree with you 100%. And and this is why I think we, uh, you know, we will approach the father as our big provider. I mean, it's like, you know, going to the genie in the bottle almost for, for some people. Right. And we're, we're, we're coming to the Lord with our agenda, with our needs, with our desires. And we, we haven't yet had that, you know, crashed into that wall of, oh my goodness, I see who I am without you, Lord. We're still trying to fix all those things that are hidden be- under the surface. And, you know, what we bury alive uh, we give power to. And so those become the narrative that that will cause us to want to, um, that the things that will guide our lives and even if we're praying. And so it's a process and God is just so patient with us, isn't he? How he'll just draw us and he allows us, listen, the, the scriptures say the rain falls. It's what you just said on the just and the unjust. Yeah. So we do experience those hardships in life and I have come to appreciate them because when I look back, I mean, can you guys look back on your, on the hard things, the hardest things, the deepest pits, and can you look at those and say, I wouldn't want to go through them again, but they're what brought me to where I am today. Could you, could you speak to that, Sean? Yeah, well, you know, absolutely. And I think the first thing that pops into my mind is that for me, what truly lit me on fire was when I realized the heart of the Father and mm-hmm. His pursuit of us. Yeah. You know, he'll leave the 99 to come find the one. Mm-hmm. The prodigal son, the Father didn't wait and go, well, it's about time you showed up. I knew you'd be back one day. No, He jumped up and ran to His son. Yeah. And then even with mm-hmm. Peter, we keep circling back to Peter. Right. You know, when the angel said to Mary, she says, go tell the disciples and Peter. Yes. God wanted to make sure Peter, boy, he's my boy. He's yeah. the rock. I'm going to build the church on him. He's, a, he's yeah. got the Jerusalem one ads trying to find a fishing job right now because he denied me. Go find him. Go find him. Yeah. Pursue him. And so I think for me, it was about in the deepest moments, mm. the darkest moments for me, when I truly understood the heart of the Father to restore relationship, mm-hmm. 
that's what I just said. I, I've got to give it all over to him. I'll go through yeah. anything for him because I was truly starting to, to get a grasp yeah. of his heart, a father to the fatherless for those people that have felt, you know, uh, uh, that they were a throwaway for someone yes. that they were disposable yeah. for him to say, Oh no, no, no. My pursuit of you is so great. I just want mm-hmm. you to run into my arms and let me show you and teach you how to mm-hmm. live the life that I created you for. Absolutely. That I mean, that what a perfect pr- picture and perfect description of the heart of Christ, which is the heart of the Father, to to reach out to us and to redeem what's been lost, what's been marred. Do you have an encouragement for that person? I mean, let's just get real here. For that person who says, well, that's fine for you guys. You know, you're beautiful. You seem to have it all together. Uh, Your lives look nothing like mine. And, you know, I am so far removed from anything godly. I don't believe in for one minute that I could ever change or be what God would want me to be. What's your answer to that? You take it first, you'll make it quick. Well, I'll just quickly <clears throat> say, uh, I don't look like this all the time. I got my fake eyelashes on. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I got my hair done. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, what, what, what you see on the outside never reveals the inside. Um, and I will tell you, uh, about six years ago, I was 100 pounds in a wheelchair mm. and seriously sick. I was dying wow. from wow. the stress that was in my life. And uh, God can help you to overcome, and He will give you the strength and the guidance to completely transform your life. Um, and it is scary. It is uh, difficult. And, um, you know, that six years ago when I looked like death, Brenda, um, when I have a picture of myself that I rarely want to look at, but I had fever blisters, my cheeks were sunk in, um, wow. I, I was dying from the stress that was in my life. And um, I had to make a courageous decision. Yes. And, you know, God step by step brought me through that. Yeah. And it is painful. It is difficult. It mm-hmm. isn't easy. Um, but he will, especially if you get into the house of God and put people around you who love you and will pray for you, he will put a nest of people around you to mm-hmm. carry you through. You can't do it alone. You yeah. have to have believers. You have to have help. You have to have the wisdom and the love around you. You know, I firmly believe I wouldn't be where I'm at without God putting those Amen. people on me to bring yeah. me through. We need community. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's his body. Mm-hmm. Sean? Well, I think for me, um, beauty is not in this. Right. It, it's, it's in what comes out of our heart. You know, God... Mm-hmm said, I created you in my image. And for me, that means he got his love. So mm-hmm. it's how do we express that in our daily life? Mm-hmm. Um, so what I want everyone to hear is, you know, I don't care what you've been through. Mm-hmm. I don't care what your story is, that you're not what has happened to you. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm. You're not the choices you've made. You're who God calls you to be. You're who God created you to be. You're a son or a daughter to the king. You're you're a royal priesthood. You have his DNA inside of you. And so what I want you to understand today is that it doesn't matter what it looks like. It only matters what his truth is. And when he said to me over a year ago, your excuses are not my truth. That shook me. Wow. Yeah. So I want anyone to know that anything is possible when we just trust him. Mm -hmm. And I know it's hard Mm -hmm. because we've had, you know, our own earthly parents who maybe didn't have it modeled for them how to be a good father, mom, whatever. We've all been through stuff. Mm -hmm. But the beauty of it is, is that our stories, those messages truly become a message of hope once we just lean into that relationship. Because I'm telling you. There's nothing like walking with him. Amen. Yeah. Amen. That's such a good word. What do you think the 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 biggest challenge uh, for you guys has been to 
overcome even knowing all these things? What's been the biggest hurdle that you have faced in terms of identity? Oh, wow. Great question. Um, you know, I think for me, uh, as Michael was talking about earlier, it's just the shame of our own choices. Mm -hmm. You know, it's tough enough to forgive someone else, but I just did a message recently at the church where I was talking about, you know, you can't even begin to forgive anyone else until you learn to forgive yourself, mm -hmm. to truly lean into yeah. his forgiveness. You know, if, if God was to fail either one of us, right? It'd be the first time in history he's ever failed a human being. And I love how Tommy Tenney says it. He says, frankly, you're just not that important. So, <laughs> so, so oh he's God. not going to mess it all up for you or me or anybody else. He, it's equal love for all of us that he says, look, I gave my son for you before you were ever a thought in your dad and mom's eyes. So here's the thing. It's just a matter of truly starting to lean into the relationship. You know, it's like anything else. I have friends that I've had for 30 some odd years that I instantly know them when they call me on the phone. Why? Because I've invested in that time. Yeah. Mm. I just encourage everyone to mm. start to make the time to spend with him. And if That's you'll so just good. do that, then his truth will penetrate any belief system that you've created or you've leaned into that it does not align with his word. And that can change and alter a life. I've seen it in my life. I've seen it in Micah's life. I've witnessed it in so many people that I know. There's nothing like his, his love that will just shift and change anyone's life. And I love that because you mentioned a belief system. And just recently for me, I think I was in this mindset or in this place of I'm not a good enough mom. I'm not a good enough pastor's wife. I'm not a good enough designer. I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. Not good enough. And so we're trying to be good enough, which is, again, a false belief because we aren't good enough. And yeah. No man is right. righteous. No, not one. That's right. <laughs> that should free yeah. us that we're not good enough. Yes. It should make us want to strive to be good enough. Yeah. And when I got liberated from why am I trying to be good enough? I'm not. Mm -hmm. Without Christ, I am nothing. Mm -hmm. That's the wrong focus. That's the wrong motivation. I am mm -hmm. to empty myself, have that relationship with him, let him pour out of me. Then I don't need to be enough because he is. I love that you said that, Micah, because we're, we keep hearing this message. You're enough. You're enough. And, you know, it, it's kind of like, we're getting a bunch of positive reinforcements thrown at us without the context of understanding the truth of that. What does that really mean in the truth of what Christ modeled for us? And, and so what you're saying is that you were enough for Jesus right where you are, as you are, and that he gave his all and the father gave his son to sacrifice his life because we were enough in our mess for him to love us, to value us, and to want to restore and re to redeem and restore us. So I think that's such a powerful message that I hope our our viewers are and our listeners are hearing today, that we're not enough without him. We are incomplete and we're always going to fail and we're always going to be hearing that, that narrative, that negative narrative that wants to drive us to be the best because we don't feel we are enough. That's so, so critical, especially for women right now. And, and, and really for men too. I mean, there's just so much pressure on men and women. And, uh, you know, speaking of relationship between men and women, I mean, we've just had so much division that we've experienced around the world and culturally in our own country and gender confusion and all these issues that are just, it's like the toothpaste is out of the tube. Um, how can we, you gave a really good example uh, uh, just a minute ago, Sean, about the, the importance and the value of spending time with him. Could you take the model of this beautiful marriage that God has rewarded you both with in this season of your life and maybe some of the elements of how do you grow a marriage or a relationship? How do you fall in love? How do we take those principles and because it's the marriage uh, uh, with the lamb, we are the bride of Christ. Can you speak to that? <laughs> sure, I'd love to. Well, first of all, you know, it starts with a choice. Yeah. Um, you have to mm. choose 
to answer his pursuit of us. You have to choose that relationship. And, you know, we chose each other knowing that we were both coming from divorces, knowing there was a lot of trauma and drama and different things we've been through. I used to say I had more issues than Life Magazine, but that's okay because my dad (laughs) knows how to read. But (laughs) so we choose it, right? Yeah. And um, we did a lot of speaking in the beginning, right? She would speak to me about what she wanted and needed, and I'd speak to her. We do that a lot with God. We do a lot of speaking in the beginning mm-hmm. because, boy, mm-hmm. I, I, if you're there, I'm going to really just throw it at you, and I'm going to download and vent. I'm going to just let it, let you have it. But what I've discovered over the last 25 years is that the more I learned to listen to him, that's when the relationship deepened because wow. it, I was allowed to hear his heart yeah. and not just to vent mine or to share mine. When yeah. we learned to listen to one another and That's truly good. listen, not listening so I can have my, my point next because, boy, right. I, we're Italian. <laughs> and we talk with our hands and we get going. And, but, but not just uh, listening to respond, but listening uh-huh. to understand. Yeah. Wow. When we started to embrace that. Marriage started to grow and deepen. When I started to embrace that with God and I would spend time with him and I would just shift, what do you want to talk about? What's on your heart today? What do you want to share? Mm. That relationship powerful. changed. And so That's it's powerful. Personal. That's so good. I know what it's like to be in a conversation that's that's a heated one. It's little becoming an argument and you know, feeling like uh, I'm I'm thinking about the next thing I'm gonna say and I'm not listening. I mean, we all have been there, right? So, uh, you know, I think that, too, is a process of learning. You, you just said it, learning to listen, uh, you know, where we're not so self-absorbed. I mean, we are living in a narcissistic culture that has unfortunately invaded the mind, penetrated the mindset of the body of Christ on so many levels. And I think that in this time of trouble and shaking, I mean, we're experiencing a, a uh, it's an opportunity that as we're experiencing this correction, this season of correction, uh, it's an opportunity for us to allow God. It, it's causing us to have to pause. We have to pause. And uh, it's unearthing all the anxieties and the fears and the things that people have long buried. And so, you know, it's it's really magnifying some of those issues that, some of us forgot we even had because we're such good performers, right? So I think that this is really a time and a season of opportunity. And in this uh, next couple minutes, I really want you to encourage that person that feels like, you know, goodness, I mean, are we headed for a world war? I mean, look at this, the troubles of our world. I'm, I'm losing uh, my hope and I, I'm, I'm depressed and I don't even... I don't even care about my goals anymore. Um, My relationships are a mess. What can you say to that person to bring them some hope right now and about the goodness of God that wants to meet them right where they are? Yeah. Can I just Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Well, when you mentioned hope, uh, the first verse that came to mind is hope deferred makes the heart sick. It Mm. does. And I have had to learn a lot about hope, um, Mm. having an addict uh, in my life to the degree that we've had, even with my kids and how they've had to uh, grieve the loss of a father, even though he's alive, but he's homeless on the yeah. streets using, right? Wow. And I think what God has really shown me about hope is that we look at hope as though it's something in the future, mm. right? But God doesn't give us hope for the future. He gives us hope for today, just like he gives grace for today. And so good. I think we get caught up in the troubles of the world and in our lives because we are so often looking at the past and then we're looking towards the future and we're not living and looking for today. Hope is for today. The only promise we have from God is today, hope for today. And so for me, it has helped me to be encouraged and help my kids to be encouraged. If they say, oh, I hope he stays sober for the next week or two. No, you have today. Hope for today today. And I think Mm -hmm. for me, when I get overwhelmed or down, I'm looking either in the past or I'm looking in the Mm -hmm. present. And really, our hope is Him for today. And that that has helped me more than anything. Um, It is my hope is for today. Yeah. Yeah. 
That's rich. Now, and now you can see why I married her, because whoo, come on, somebody. <laughs> come on, somebody. <laughs> wow, that was I do. Thing. I do uh, see it. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, uh, for me, I always revert back to Scripture where it says, hope is the anchor of our soul. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we have hope for today, and I can mm. anchor in that, it helps me live life moment to moment. We get so caught up trying to live life day to day, week to week, month to month, trying to look ahead and have all this chronic anxiety of what may happen. Mm -hmm. Instead of mm -hmm. saying, look, I'm going to lock into this moment. I tell my kids all the time, just win the moments. And that's all yeah. you have to do. But hope is the anchor of our soul. Now, with that said, none of this that we're experiencing right now surprises God. Mm -hmm. None of it. None of this has surprised him. And so what I really lean into is that we live in a fallen world. Good things happen to bad people. Bad things happen to good people. But as long as I know that God is with me on the journey, that I know that I'll be okay. You know, That's if good. he's counted the hair on my head, now there's not as much as there used to be, but what I'm saying <laughs> is if he's counted the hair on our head, if he's, if he's caught my tears and put them in a bottle, mm. yeah. his thoughts are more yeah. about me you and you, then all the sand on the seashore, then I can rest in that. Let hope be the anchor of my soul and know that no matter what today or tomorrow brings, he mm. is with me. Amen. And what greater hope could we have than that? I mean, it is a journey and we're so destination oriented that sometimes God has to just pull back the reins and say, just let me walk with you. Let me talk with you. And all the joys that we find on that journey. I, I'm right there with you guys. I, I love him so much because I have learned to enjoy the journey and to dance even if it's raining. I've learned to find yeah. my joy in the midst of even the heartbreaks and the heartaches. How can everybody find you? I'm sure people are going to want to come visit your church when they're in Oklahoma City. How can they find you and your ministry? You know, yeah. you said dancing with him, and it reminded mm -hmm. me of that whole, you know, footprints thing. And I know there's times that I walk beside him, holding his hand. We skip, we run, we laugh, we dance, we play. There's also times he picks me up and he carries me. Oh, but regardless, yeah. we're mm -hmm. always on that journey together, right? Yes. Yeah. And yeah. that's what makes it so powerful. Um, yeah. We're both on social media. Um, mm -hmm. The Oaks is on Facebook and Instagram, the Oaks OKC uh, dot church website. Um, I'm on social media. She is with her company as well. And if you pray for me, there really isn't a voice that's speaking about design and how to honor yeah. God. And yes. I do know that God is the ultimate designer and he cares oh. about design. And yes. But there's not a lot of talk about why design can be good. And because yeah. I think our country has swung a pendulum a bit where there's mm -hmm. an excess of design a little bit as well. So yeah. I've really been praying about how God could help mm -hmm. me be a voice out there about how to honor God in your home. Mm -hmm. design. I love that because we're creating an atmosphere. Yes. And oftentimes that was something that when I was uh, in interior design full time, I, I knew I was creating an atmosphere, an atmosphere of uh, where people could come to heal or to, you know, for blessing. And uh, it's amazing. I, I totally believe in that. And we see it all through the Old Testament uh, mm -hmm. in, in the Bible. So that's that's beautiful. And we'll have to talk about that sometime in another mm -hmm. conversation. <laughs> but, you know, you guys, I really appreciate you taking the time to stop off your busy schedules and come together with us and have this conversation with me. I think you're both wonderful, beautiful people. And uh, I know that you've been through a lot in your life, but the the word of hope that you bring and the, the um, attitude and the understanding of who we are in Christ is everything. And I hope that our viewers, I know that they were blessed today. So thank you for, for being here. Well, thank you for having us and just giving us that opportunity to show our scars and tell our story and just share people with people about the heart of the Father, because that's yes. our life now, and we, and we love getting those opportunities to do that. Amen. Well, friends, I want to thank you, too, for spending this time with us. I know that you were blessed, 
And I invite you to go to their website and check out their ministry. And uh, I'm also going to invite you to return and come and hear another one. In the meantime, I'm Brenda Crouch. Be blessed.